You might remember that yesterday I asked the question, what's your memory like? And I'd like to carry on that theme today by looking at a very tough verse in the book of Romans. It says this in my Bible, We know in everything God works for good for those who love him or call according to his purpose. Or put it another way, all things work together for good. That's hard, isn't it, when we go through difficult times, like Jeremiah yesterday, when we are struggling and battling with disappointment and despondency and disease. But I want to emphasize this this morning. May you always remember, remember I talked about your memory, may you always remember that God is in control. A friend of ours called yesterday with a little gift for, her, for us. She, we didn't break social distancing. We separated. She left the she left the little gift on the door, and she actually handed us not just a couple of goodies, but a, a lovely little bookmarker. And it said, "Always remember, God is in control." Knowing God has a plan for our lives, it says, is very important. Putting our faith in God allows us to trust that the events in our lives are meant to be. It helps us to make choices that must be made and realize things are not really out of control, they are under his control. There is a peace that can be found knowing that his plan is playing out in our lives. God is in control, trust him, he loves you. And that's a quote from somebody called Rick Norman. It's not always easy to remember when you're going through difficult times that God is in control and God is with us. If you get an opportunity, read the, the book of Gen Genesis chapter 39. It's the story of Joseph. Four times in chapter 39 it says, And the Lord was with Joseph. Now you might assume that because the Lord was with Joseph, everything was a bed of roses, but that's not the case at all. His life was a battlefield. God was with Joseph, but he didn't stop him stop. suffering from the jealousy of his brothers. His own family sold him into slavery and resented his special destiny. Are you going? The fact that he was with him did not screen Joseph from temptation. Joseph was young, sinful and alone. And yet, a woman in the house of Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, in fact, tried to seduce him. And the Lord was with Joseph in all of this. Now remember, all things work together for good. Joseph went to prison because of that lady's will. He could not speak for himself in the sense that nobody would listen to him. He was a slave. He went to prison for 13 years for a crime he did not commit. I don't know if he'd feel resentful, bitter and angry. The Lord was with Joseph. Remember, God has a plan for your lives, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. He didn't stop him suffering from disappointment like Jeremiah yesterday. When he interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker in that prison, he said to the butler, don't forget me, and of course the butler forgot. Mm. And perhaps you are being forgotten. Perhaps you've done things for people and they've never even said thanks. That's the way it is. You give people the best, and all they give you is hurt. Perhaps you've been in the pit, like Joseph. Perhaps you've been slandered, like Joseph. Perhaps you've been forgotten like Joseph. But you know, after those awful experiences, he went from the pit to the prison to the palace. Mm -hmm. God was at work in everything and working out his purposes. And he went and became the Prime Minister and saved his nation. All things work together for good. God is working his purpose out in our lives right now. And it's not always easy when things aren't going as well as we expected. In fact, 
sometimes things go very wrong as far as we're concerned. And it's a struggle on the back of the whole world. When did I start? I said, all things work together for good. I said, what's your memory like? Remember, always, God is in control. We used to sing a song a long, long time ago. God is still on the throne. <laughs> and he will remember his own. And when trials may press us and birds distress us, he never will be us alone. God is on your side today. God is on your team. God is with you. So rehearse those things today. Like I encouraged you yesterday with Jeremiah. Remember, God is still in control. And he's in charge. So today, whatever today is going to bring, I want to encourage you to say that you're not on your own. The Lord is holding your hand. And he will bring you through this. And to look back and think, you think, wow, Lord, you were amazing. You brought us through this. And it's too big to So let's pray to him. Father, I thank you for another day. I thank you for another thought. I pray you help us to hang on to this thought today, knowing that you are in control. And that nothing happens to you without you knowing about it and you being there with us in here. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we'll get, we'll get yeah, yeah, we'll get that yeah. one off for you. Yeah. Mm. He always brings a good word, David. Yeah. Now, who's that, David? David uh, Jones from Wales. David Jones from Wales. Our friends yes. from Wales. Yeah. In the ship. Yeah. That's enough to put on the recording yeah. tonight. So it, the recording's on. Yeah. And uh, we're doing Hebrews 9 tonight. So, um, but, um, and you've been out today? Yes. Gwen's birthday? Well, um, yes, but the birthday lady had to go to Adelaide. So. Oh, right. So we're I... doing it again next week. Right. But we did have the rest of us enjoyed lunch. And, yes. hmm. It was a good day. Good day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got the text from, we were out shopping at the time. And, yeah, uh, in the middle of a shopping, so we couldn't really. <laughs> oh, Vera yeah. sent us a text saying, she said, I know it's a yes. bit late. But if you're able to, yes. we would have had we had, yeah. Well, we rang a, she rang a few, and one of them was able to come down and chat for a while. Yes. Spend a little bit of time. Mm. Oh, so that cool. Was good. Yes. Because mm. oh, none of us, you know, hadn't caught up. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. We wouldn't have caught up for a while, yeah. Yeah. Are you warming up? Cause is that too hot now? Do you want to turn off now? Uh, I'm okay at the moment. Yeah? Okay, you too hot, Peter. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, if you need a blanket, you've got a blanket. Yeah, so I think we get straight into the study. Now we've got questions to guide us tonight. So that's uh, Hebrews chapter 9. And, uh, So, it's a long chapter too. It, it is, but I think it, it, it breaks off into a few sections. But um, what, have, what have you got out of Hebrews so far? That's the first question. And I'm just... Um, Do you want a chapter read first? No, not, not yet. We'll just have a, a talk about um, what's, what's one point you have gleaned from our study of Hebrews so far. We've covered a lot of oh, things, we have. haven't we? We've I gone think through it. One of the main things for me was you know how powerful the new covenant is and uh, the priesthood of Jesus. <laughs> um, you know, I mean that's fair the two important ones. You know, I know it's all important, but I found those two were important for me, you know. Yeah. The new covenant and the, the priesthood that never ends. He's, he's constantly intercedes for us. The new covenant made with mm. church that's, uh, mm. that's, um, 
yeah, it, it's so vastly different for us to what the uh, Old Testament people had. Yes. It's vastly yeah. different. You'd bring along a bull to church, would you? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they had, you know... The Imagine priests. having the kids there. Yeah, well, And, and the, the, the priest would have to slip the throat yeah, and all the blood yeah. and stuff. I think we've got, we're this side of the cross. They yeah. were before the cross. Yes. How different it was, the two, yeah. Mm. Mm. I'll take a different tact. Um, one thing that I... Glean from Hebrews is just the way the book is set out itself, and in the setting out of it, how um, Paul showed how Jesus has been part of um, the Jewish faith from even before it began, and how um, Jesus is woven in like he's superior to the angels. He's he was there before Abraham was called mm. the father. But there was that linkage to Melchizedek. There's, um, and probably all the way through to the rest of Hebrews, how Jesus is there, and um, and that he's important to the Hebrew faith, apart from the fact he's the Messiah. But they could, how the writer of Hebrews could link him right back to um, to the beginning of the birth of the Jewish nation, and how even like the tabernacle, everything was a shadow, which was. Jesus was part of that, mm. Mm. and um, and it, you know, like as Mum had said about the priesthood and um, the Sabbath rest, all the mm. things that we've covered up to now, how Jesus was in there, even though the Jews before they became Christians had become followers of Christ, had all that, but now the writer of the book is showing them Jesus was there all the time. I think this is the book that is written to Christians and uh, it's one that really stands out as saying, well, if you're not going forward, you can't stand still, mm -hmm. so you'll go backwards. Because mm -hmm. so, you've, um, you've, it says you've tasted of these things, you've tasted of the Spirit and uh, consequently. Now, it's been a query as to when it was written and... Um, why it was written? Who wrote it? <laughs> uh, who wrote it? All of those have been big questions. But, but the thing is that uh, the best analysis that we have is that it was written to the Hebrew Christians at Rome when it was under Nero, when it was under persecution. And the best way that the Jews could get out of being persecuted was to go back to their Jewish faith. Because the Jews were not regarded as a threat to Nero. You could have, you could be a Jew and not, uh, suffer persecution. But if you were a Christian, you would have, you would suffer persecution. When Nero burned Rome, uh, many Christians were, were persecuted. Nero blamed it on the Christians as to why Rome burned. But, um, we heard the, the simple statement that Nero fiddled while Rome burned, that sort of thing. So, uh, but if you went back to the Jewish faith, you would have to deny that Jesus was the Messiah, because they would not accept Jesus as the Messiah. And so, remembering what Jesus said, if you deny me before men... I will deny you before the Father. And so that's the thing here, because Paul is saying, hey, look, if you go back, don't go back, because it's, you're going back to a lesser thing. You're going back to something that's inferior. And that's, that's, that's pretty powerful. Hmm. Anything else that stands out to you from Hebrews that we've done so far? Now, I think we'll read verses 1 to 8. Anyone like to read verses 1 to 8? Mm -hmm. 
Then verily the first covenant had also or ordinances of divine service and the worldly sanction. For there was a tabernacle made first, with it wherein was made the candlestick, and the table and the sweet sweet bed, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second meal, the tabernacle which is called the Holy Stable, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid around about with gold, wherein was the gold pot. They had manna and Aaron's rod and butter and the tables of the covenant. And over it in the cher- cherubims of glory shown the mercy seat of God we cannot now seek past the okay. Now when these things were all day, first all day, the priest went into the first tabernacle and not really prepared for God. Then the second went the high priest atoned once every year and not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the others. One being the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made for man is whilst at the first tabernacle was standing. Mm-hmm. Which the no, you stayed there, you stopped there just for a moment. Um, so the question we've got here is what did the ceremonies for atoning for their sins look like in the old covenant? Mm-hmm. How would you be? That, you've got a description of the old covenant, uh, old covenant uh, uh, things that were there. When you walked into that temple, yeah. what would you see? Well, you'd see so many things there that you don't see in churches today, do you? Oh, that's right. Um, <coughs> one thing that does stand out is, you know, you, you had all priests doing the things that were required in the tabernacle. But, uh, can you imagine what it would be like back then? Yeah. With their robes and all their regalia would be the high priest would have had a particular mm. regalia and costume and so on. And then you would have had all the um, furniture in the table that signified everything had a purpose from the candlestick to the showbread, to the golden censer, and then there was the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with the pure, you know, with gold, mm-hmm. and the golden pot where the manna got God to remind them of the ways in the wilderness, yeah. the manna got the God, and Aaron's rod, yeah. yes. and the, the Ten Commandments, with the, mm. the covenant that was made with Moses. Yeah. I mean, it was a phenomenal thing. What stands out to me is it refers to the tabernacle, not the temple. Oh, yes. There was a tabernacle. Yeah, the yeah. Was that was something that God had designed for them when they were in the wilderness. Yeah, and they had to set it up. Mm-hmm. Every time they moved somewhere else, they had to set up the tabernacle. Yeah, yeah they just got to set up the day. Mm-hmm. And if they had only had two days in the place, they'd have to pack it all up again yeah. and go, or if they stayed a year in a place, they'd let the, yeah. the it. it was work. Because mm. I was thinking around, like when it came to the sacrifices, there was no mute button. You would have had the, um, the mooing of the cows, the barring of the lambs, the yeah. bleeding of the goats, mm. the fluttering of the pigeons and the doves, and, and, um, and then just the noise of you know, for want of better words, the killing, the slaughtering of the animals mm. and and the altars that would have been outside of the tabernacle, like the busy part of the um, mm. part of that, mm. which all the children of Israel, because they had their tents, they had a particular way of which each three tribes had to be around the um, tabernacle when mm. they camped. So, um, you know, so they would have heard all of that and and, um, yeah, so it's interesting, but the actual tabernacle itself was a quiet place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got a veil mm. between the holy place and the most holy place. Mm. Now, only the high priest could go in 
once a year. And that was the Day of Atonement. That was the day when all of the sins of the Israelites were put on the scapegoat for one, and he sent off the scapegoat into the wilderness, and and uh, yeah, and the other was slain, and and uh, the high priest had to go in. But first of all, you notice it says in verse verse seven. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So that was a very, very uh, traumatic job, really, because mm-hmm. if you went in there into the holiest of holies and you didn't do the right thing there and it was a rope around your leg and they pulled you out. So all this was showing that God is a holy God and we need to approach him with a clean hands and a pure heart. Mm-hmm. And and but this, even the high priest himself had to offer a sacrifice for himself mm-hmm. because for his own sins And this was the old covenant. But they needed to do that. God said, do this. Because he wanted a a people that would be holy. Holy to himself. The the ceremonies for atoning for their sins. If you committed a sin, in the Old Testament, you would have to find a way of atoning for it. And God provided a way through the sacrifices that were done. It says without rem- without uh, the shedding, of, shedding blood. of blood, there was no remission of sin, no cancelling out of sin. But this is only, it never made him perfect. Okay? Mm. Now, verse 8, oh, interesting. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. So, just looking at that, do you see the Holy Spirit working in the Old Testament? Mm. We often think of the Father and we see Jesus in every book in the Old Testament. But this, Paul is referring to the Holy Ghost here. But the, the Holy Ghost teaches us that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made Clear. The first tabernacle was still standing, but that would not take away the sin. Other every every day they'd have to do that. They'd have to offer sacrifice for sins. But that once a year was the important thing. It was around about October, September, October each year. We needed a better covenant because everyone everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay. This next question, what are the differences between the high priests of the Old Covenant and Jesus, the high priest of the New Covenant? We've seen the high high priest of the Old old Covenant in verse 7. He went in once a year. Annually, yeah. Annually. Each year. Each year. So Jesus, once and for all, only once did he need to. Because of his death and resurrection that did away with all the other sacrifices. That's how Christ is so superior because mm. he didn't have to offer a sacrifice for his for own sin. sin. Because he was sinless. Yeah. I think in verse 11, I know they haven't got to that yet. But Christ then come up, high priest do good things to come. But a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. Mm. That is to say, not of this building. Yeah. So I think um, the difference between the high priest and the old covenant, they had a physical tabernacle which uh, had a pattern laid to it. There were the um, people, that the craftsmen that were called to fashion build it. Whereas with Jesus, um, being the high priest of the new covenant, the tabernacle is not made of hands. And and Jesus is the high priest that he's the head with the body. 
Yeah. And I can see that um, where the Holy Spirit comes in, you know, where Jesus says many are called but few are chosen, and how um, the Holy Spirit, you know, we God loved us first before we loved him, and in that um, the Holy Spirit helps to fashion us into the articles of worship and, and that part of that living tabernacle to um, be used for the worship of God. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it would be good to look at what the verse we looked at on Sunday. Um, 1 Corinthians 6. I'm just remind me of that because the, the shape of us, uh, there is a new tabernacle. See, the, the tabernacle that, that Christ purified through his blood is a heavenly tabernacle of which God said, make sure you fashion the physical mm-hmm. tabernacle according to the pattern that I give you, and this pattern was the heavenly mm-hmm. tabernacle. And with those people that were called to be um, the makers, right, to build that tabernacle, God had said his spirit would be on them yeah. to guide them to the pattern. Like God showed Moses what the pattern was, but also those people were, had to interpret how that would actually look like. Yeah. So they needed the spirit of God to guide them to make those things. The brass was, I mean, there's so much overlay of gold. What cherubim would look like? It's yeah, easy yes. to put down and say, well, here's what a cherubim would look like. Here's the um, silk, the wool, whatever, but how you actually put it together. I mean, I know when I knit, it's nice to have a pattern, but it's also when you know what stitches to use, you can create your own patterns. Um, But God had already set a pattern, Mm. what he wanted in his house. And uh, and so the Spirit of God, I can see where the Spirit is in the Old Testament, imparted those skills, was able to blossom those skills from those two people to put all this together. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's uh, have you found 1 Corinthians 6, yeah, 19 and 20? 19 and 20. Have you got that? Uh, Do you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Yeah, is, it, is that... Do you want me to continue? Is that it? Mm-hmm. Stop that. This verse 19 and 20. Mm-hmm. Right. Now for the matters. No. Right. Here we go. Mine says, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Oh, that's not. Right. Why not? Oh, that's yeah. Interesting. You have different translations. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And in your spirit, which are God's. Yeah. So suddenly we've got. Um, our body, everything we do has been bought by the blood of Jesus. Now that's the blood that went into the Holy of Holies in heaven. So that cleanses us. Like the priest, the high priest who went into the Holy of Holies, he had to first of all have blood sacrificed for his own sin. If we read verses at 10, through to 14. Help me to do that. Yes, thanks, Mom. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is the most important part of the chapter because what cleanses you from a guilty conscience? Well, first of all, to to make it simpler, 
Have you ever had a goalie conscience? <laughs> yes. Have you ever done anything wrong? Yes. No. <laughs> no. No, okay. <laughs> no, okay. What makes you not remember it? <laughs> ah, no, no, no. Remember what that David Jones said? Have uh, you got difficulty in remembering? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, uh, well, I mean... I'm sure that uh, that we know what it is to, to have guilt. Uh, but we, we get told, so many in the world say, oh, just get over it. Just forget about it. And new day tomorrow. But it's not like that, is it? You know, there, there are things that people can... We've got a conscience that when it's awakened that we've done something wrong, doesn't let us sleep unless we want to sort of ignore it completely and God cuts it off. But, um, but the thing is, this, these verses here are so precious because there is a place. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, the aim of it is not so much to dwell on the past, but to get forgiven. But to get forgiven, and so that you walk away free from the past, because you've been forgiven by God. Only God can forgive sin. That's why it's so important that we really keep a close account with God. That's why I'm sort of thinking in um, chapter 6, where it goes through the foundation foundations of our faith. You know, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Yes. And faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and laying of the hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And so looking at verse fourteen, how much shall the blood of Christ he through the eternal spirit offered himself with that spot to God, purge your conscience from dead work. So the reason why we've got to have those foundations is so that we serve the living God. Yeah. Mm. Yep. It's to serve. We've, we've been saved to serve. Mm. Now, um, you know, what can wash away your sin? That's the question is, there's been a song that's been sung about that, but it's, it's, it's only the blood of Jesus that can purge us of our sin. Mm. Why? Because it was sinless blood. Not like the priest always had to offer sacrifice himself. And the blood of goats and bulls could not be enough. Mm. Other, that's why they did it every year. Mm. It only lasted once a year. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm. Whereas with Christ, it's not like we have to do it every year. It's like it's once. Just as his sacrifice was once and for all. Yeah. For us, that initial, when we start our walk with God and walk along our, along the Christian way, that being at the cross is that purging all of what we've done before then, that we didn't realise we had, um, sin against a holy God. When the when God starts calling us and we realise as we get closer to the light how dirty we are. Yeah. Mm. Now the interesting thing that we see coming into this is you know, have all of you made a will? Yes. You made a will? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, when would that will come into effect? No, no. <laughs> exactly. That's what this whole thing is Jesus had to die so that the old covenant, the old will, could be done away with. That's the beauty of this. And uh, you know, it, it says here in, in this whole area that God ma- had to make a new will, a new covenant, a new agreement. But the new agreement couldn't come into effect until there was a death. And that happened at the cross. Jesus died for our sin. He took on on us, took our sin upon him so that we 
could be free. And so he could inherit eternal yes. life. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, when the, when the will is written, uh, the person can, you know, in the old days, in, well, not so old, but it was around about the times when people would start to think about their expectations. And uh, they would think, oh, what am I going to get out of this person? And so they would be very, uh, they'd think, oh, well, I could get uh, a large amount of money. So they'd start spending it before the person died. Mm. Now, if the person realised that that was what they were going to do, they could change the will. So then they would be left with a big debt with that. Mm. So, but it's different with us in you know, that Christ, um, Christ paid it paid our debts completely by forgiving us of our sins because of the blood that he shed for us. Now, a lot of the Jews these days don't believe that Jesus died for them. Even though they, Isaiah 53 points to it. And uh, consequently, they're looking for, for the Messiah to come. Here we go. We, we find now that this is the time where... Um, Jesus is the better high priest because he is the priest of the new covenant the new agreement so I think we've covered how our sins are atoned for in both covenants we could quickly review that just for a moment if you were living back before Jesus died on the cross how would your sins be atoned for? If I were a Jew, it would be through sacrifice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we look at verse 7 and verse 28. Yes, would you like to read verse 7? But, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So that was the way that they actually atoned for sin. Mm. Now verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of men, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Okay. Now, that's interesting in verse 28, isn't it? Unto them that look for him. Do you think the world is looking for Christ today? Yeah. No. He's coming as the judge the second time. Yeah. He's coming as the, the one who will um, make up for the injustices that have occurred. Now, how is Christ's offering superior to the high priests of the Old Covenant? Now, it seems we're looking at how much better the work of Christ is and what he's done. Uh, verse 14, Diana, do you want to read that? How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, mm. yeah. so that we may serve the living God. Yeah, that's that's the difference. That's how how Christ is so much better than anything that uh, the early Jews would ever have to do. Uh, verse twenty-five. I'm just thinking, Kate, have you got that one? No. Uh, chapter 9. Hebrews, Hebrews. Hebrews 9, uh, verse 25. Here it is. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest of priest entered, entered into the holy place every year with blood of the Lord. So there okay. must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Now, once in the end of the world, have he appeared to put my sin by, by the sacrifice of himself? Yeah. yeah. That's the power, isn't it? You know, we sing the song, there's power in the blood. 
power in the blood, mm. power in the blood of Jesus. And truly, that blood still has power to bring people into a place where they can be friends with God. I'm going to read that 16 and 17 to emphasize the fact. It says, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be death of the testator. In other words, like what you said, uh, Kate, when you've got a will, it doesn't come into place until you're dead. Mm-hmm. Okay? For a testament is a force after men die are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. While, while you're living, that has no pressure whatsoever. So, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, and it goes through one of the things that they did in the Old Testament, where they would take a, a branch of hyssop and dip it in the blood of, of the animal, and then they would sanctify all of it. When, when Aaron got consecrated as a priest, they had the blood put on him. So the blood actually sealed and made holy. Sep- well, it doesn't mean to be made holy. It means to be separated off for the use that God's got for you. Mm. And this is the whole point of these sacrifices, was that these people were designed to be holy to God. They were to be separated for His purposes. Now, they weren't always doing what God wanted. Mm. And uh, so this is where we needed another sacrifice in Jesus. Mm. At that verse 19. And when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the people and all the people. And then, like 21, moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So I'm thinking, like, um, if you go back to 11. But Christ did then come a high priest of good things to come, but a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And I'm thinking, if we, and through the salvation of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, we become sprinkled by his blood, we become the vessels of ministry within that tabernacle, Mm. and we can't be there unless we're being sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Yeah. And sanctified so that we are holy, holy to be used in service towards God. Hmm. Now, how can we? It's one thing to be saved; it's another thing to be used in service, and that is sort of be made clean <clears throat> from your past by the blood of Jesus. But to be cleansed, to know the truth, we need the the Word of God every day, don't we? Yeah, and you look in that 19th, there was a blood of cows and goats, and with water. Yes. Yeah. So as the scripture says, and with the washing of the water mm, by the Word. Of. So it's, it's a beginning, isn't it? You know, to be brought to that place where the blood of Christ purges our conscience mm. and all the things from the past. Mm. Yeah, it all, yeah, just in that 19 where you can see where Jesus really did fulfill it all. Because I was thinking, it's great to inherit eternal life. And, you know, but what do you do with that eternal life? You know, God gives us that eternal life, but there's also, we've got to live one yes. of those things with life is... The verb is to live. Yeah. So then, what do we do with the life that God has given us? Yeah. And, and that, that's, that's where it's said here. Says, that. That's yeah. amazing. It's not like we're just kept safe from the evil or the wickedness of this world. There's actually, um, in that having life, that we are going to live, and then you've got to think about what does living in God's kingdom look like? Hmm. 
Mm. Oh, Jesus it's gave it. us some direction for yeah. how to live. Yeah. In the and you've got Hebrews 12, haven't you? Yeah. Where it says, present your body. Yeah. Is there something sometimes you know, like with the sacrifice of war or when there's been a major conflict or a major disaster, um, there can be people that come through that and you think of the Holocaust or, or any major disaster, sometimes those survivors can um, almost feel like, you know, why have I been kept when so many other people have died or haven't made it? Yes. And they can almost lose that will to live. But So when we are saved, God gives us a purpose to live. Mm. Yeah, Does it make past, sense? Yeah, it's getting the past dealt with. You can yeah. often be dragged back by the guilt of your past, yes. can't you? By the things that you've done. But God says, well, look, I've forgotten that now that you've mm. been cleansed and purged by the blood of Jesus. Now get on with living. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now forget creation, those things. You've got my name yeah. on you. Mm. And that's where sometimes people that come through major disasters, the, the word thinks, well, you've been saved for a purpose. Um, and there's been some... I've, heard, I've seen or read from Holocaust victims, it's like they may have been the only one out of their whole family um, that survived from that, but they themselves have gone on to have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and then they've been able to share their story, their background to the rest of the world so it wouldn't happen again. Yes. But how much more is it when we come into Christ? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, of sharing our walk with him or the joy of salvation so other people can be awakened and not have to live a life without him Mm. and without a future. Yeah, so thinking about, okay, how you can uh, live from there on, Jesus taught us. And Mm. we go back to the word of God in Matthew. We can look at Matthew chapter 5, I think, to finish off with tonight, um, to look at how Jesus said we are to live once we become parts of his kingdom. Mm. How do you get into the kingdom of God? He says, you must be born again. If you're not born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. But in Matthew chapter 5, um, we see how Jesus says we are to live. And... Uh, and it's a radical way. It's, it's something really precious, isn't it? I think it would be good good way for us to combine Hebrews is saying we, we've got a new way but he was encouraging the, the, the Hebrew Christians not to go back mm. but he was also encouraging them to go forward mm. and uh, part of that would be the teachings that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 5 have we, have we got a few? we've got a few yep, you've got it mm. you know? and seeing the Multitudes who went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be fulfilled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness, sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all the better. Manners of evil against you for sin for my sake. The joy and be exceedingly glad for the great in the name of what the Lord had for so persecuted that they the prophets which were before you. Yeah. Mm. So that's, you can't do that if you, you know, yeah, if you were really just being in that place where you were going to. Uh, get a person back for treating you badly. That's not what God's saying, is it? If you're part of his kingdom, then he's saying, 
blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, when they persecute you for righteousness' sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All these is a different way of living. A different way. I love it, verse 6, where it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. So when, and like in, um, when it comes a bit later in, in Matthew, or not that far away, and it says, Ask, seek, and knock. Mm. And, the, you know, you will receive and hear that and he will answer. And it's like, in this, but they shall be filled. Yeah. Nobody would be disappointed in God. But you've got to have that within your heart to go seeking that and yeah. you will find it. Mm. I like that one, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall seek God. You're looking in the kingdom of darkness, you're not going to find much there. No. You're not going to find much joy. So I, I see from the book of Hebrews, then, these were people that were under persecution, uh, and they'd lost their homes. Some of them had lost their goods and everything around that time. And uh, they were tempted to go back into the Jewish faith. But Paul says, hey, you're going back to rubbish. You're going back to something which has been de- deleted, if you like, and there's something new being placed. There's a better place for you. There's a better way for you to walk. There's been an upgrade, an update, which is Jesus <laughs> yes. Christ, and now you want to delete that and, yeah, go back to... Go back to the old ways, the old laws. Which is in it, which is going to... Going to wear out. Yeah, where viruses can get in. But you know, God never ever forgot his people. Mm-hmm. Even though they've walked away from him, he's, he still loves his people. Still loves the Jews, still looks to them. And uh, he'll keep his promise to them even though they've been unfaithful. He never ma- he never divorces his people. And uh, it's, it's so good. Well, that stretched the imaginations tonight. Mm-hmm. It didn't stretch the... Okay. Well... Anything else you want to add? Hebrews 10, 11 and 12 are really something else. It, it really lays it out very very clear, clearly and very succinctly that uh, Jesus is superior above all. He died once for all. And in Hebrews 12 it says, But we see Jesus. Does mm-hmm. someone like to close up in prayer? Father, we just thank you for your word to us tonight. We thank you for the book of Hebrews. We thank you, Lord, for the one who wrote it, Lord, and for all the important areas, Lord, of the difference between the old and the new covenant. And how, Father, Jesus came to set us free, not to bind us up, not to bring us into bondage, but to set us free. And Father, we thank you for the freedom we have in Jesus. So long as we stay in him, so long as we follow him, so long as we are faithful to your word, we are free. And that's what will keep us free. Because Jesus makes us free. He sets us free. And Lord, we thank you for that freedom we have. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for your care, for your precious promises that you have given to each one of us here. And it's all in your word. And we realise more and more, Lord, how important your word is, that we are really in your word and your word in us. So, Lord, we thank you tonight. And we bless you and praise your great name, for you are a holy, righteous God.